One of the things about a conference of this character is it's an amazing collective thinking process. And I, I don't know about the rest of you, but from day one, from the very first session and for the sessions that followed, I felt myself thinking. <laughs> and I think I could hear the brains clicking around the hall that day. Numerous questions, probably more questions than answers. But I think it's been pretty good collective sharing of experiences type, thinking out the big problems, revisiting issues perhaps that we've visited before, and perhaps for a lot of people, covering issues and looking at perspectives for the first time, perspectives about changing our society. And I think we could fairly sum up some things that are relatively uncontroversial that come out of the proceedings and the discussions in this conference. And one of them, I guess in the category of things that we do know, is the absolute necessity in our time to confront the need to change this political system. It's driven by a powerful justice motive. You know, you can think about many things that you heard or saw during this conference that underline this. But last night, at the cultural event in Newtown, so watch that image of Ban Singh, the Dalit fighter from India, who because he stood up to the ruling elites who raped, gang raped his daughter and his family stood up to it, saw them go to jail. He paid a terrible price because they came out from jail later on and they came up, they, 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 they got him and they cut off both of his arms and they cut off his leg. And there, there was Ban Singh last night saying, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to keep fighting. Ban Singh continues to sing. And I, and I think that image was seared into my mind, and I, I, I think into many, one, uh, many other people's minds. And the other thing, which was very clear, when Ian Angus, in particular, did his launch uh, of his new book, was the absolute imperative of transforming the system that comes from the climate change crisis. We want to have a livable planet to bequeath to our children and our grandchildren and their grandchildren. We've got to face up to this challenge. And it's not a case of a little bit of tinkering here and there. It's a case of confronting the absolute blockage that the immense concentration of wealth in the hands of a few poses to just this challenge. It is just not possible in a world where 1% owns as much as 99, the other 99%, to have the kind of changes and transformations that are needed simply to keep the planet livable. Not possible. Inconceivable. Not possible not only theoretically, but on the basis of everything we have seen and experienced collectively this far. I think we know a few other things as well. And as I was listening to Uncle Ken Canning, a First Nations candidate who's heading the Socialist Alliance Senate New South Wales ticket in the coming federal elections, if we listen to what the First Nations peoples from all around the world are saying, the appeal to return, to appeal to return to a form of social organisation that puts social cooperation and respect for land, front and centre of our existence, if you listen to them and you listen to the message that Ian put forward to, that pointed out the obvious fact that what these First Nations people are telling us is that the kind of society that we have been told to accept as natural, the class divided societies that we have been told to accept as natural are in fact a small 
aberration in the context of human existence. For hundreds or for tens of thousands of years, probably more than a hundred thousand years, humans have had to survive by cooperating and by respecting the land. And it's only in a very short period that we've broken from these values, from this way of organizing society. And I think furthermore, we understand and that we know enough to understand that there is the absolute possibility of us returning to a society based on cooperation and respect for land, not only by retreating technologically to an earlier time, but with the full advantage of the technological advances that human beings have collectively made since then. Do we know this only in theory? Or do we know it in more than theory? And I say, those of us who are fortunate to live in the most developed parts of the world have no excuse for not facing up to the fact that we know it in our own experience. Free quality school education. Most people in this country took it for granted. It's under threat now. It was working perfectly well. It didn't need the profit motive. You know, you send your kids to school, you didn't think twice, you didn't think whether the primary school teachers, you know, had to have a, a, a fat profit at the end of the day or they wouldn't teach their kids. You didn't have to worry about whether the headmistress was going to get a big fat CEO, uh, what, what do they call it? <laughs> Bonus. 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 If they sacked half the staff over the year. I mean, that's beginning to happen now as you get the privatisation of the school system. We know it works. We have seen it work and generation after generation have enjoyed the fruits of this aspect of social organisation, which is a little taste of the socialism that's ahead of us. We've seen it in our hospital system. I had a heart attack when I was 55. I, I got to appreciate it on the pointy end of the health system. And I tell you what, I really respect those those, those, those health workers in that hospital and, and, and I was lucky two years later to be able to go down to a picket line outside the same hospital with a sign saying I support you and they were on strike. <laughs> I'm here today, I survived because of, of your work and they didn't need the capitalist system to give them that. So we know these things, we know these things for, for, for a fact. Now then we start to move into the more complicated sort of uh, things that we've been talking about today. And I agree, I agree with something Marta said today, and it really struck me when she said it. You know, we live in an age where rebellions, uprisings are happening, ready or not. You know, it's really struck me over the last period. I mean, you know, say two words, Arab Spring. Well, Arab Spring, Arab Spring's not fair because there's a whole string of uprisings we have seen. People are rising in revolt against this, ex is this, this system, ready, ready, ready or not. And therefore, the question I think that Marta also posed is that ready not or not is not good enough. Ready or not is not good enough because the masses can rise up in rebellion and then they can get squashed. You know, the military can come in and take over and you're back to square one, or sometimes not even back to square one, three steps further back uh, than where we were before, as we have seen in, in Egypt in, and in other parts of the Middle East. So ready or not, this stuff is happening. And I think another interesting aspect, which is a bit, to me, a warning, a ready or not warning, that applies not just to the third world, but to countries like this. If you look at another development that I think has charged the discussion at this conference, and that is the, the whole Bernie Sanders, Jeremy Corbyn phenomena, to me that's a bit of a warning about ready or not, even in the richest part of the world. People are sick about this, sick of this system. And you know, you <laughs> 
They will rise up in places you don't expect. I mean, let's be honest. Last year, this time, who in the room imagined that there would be millions of people in the United States prepared to put their hands in the pocket and pull out money for a candidate who said he was a socialist and donate millions of dollars. These are not rich people. These are people who are struggling to live. <coughs> Would you? I, I, I don't think anyone. I certainly didn't think. I couldn't possibly imagine. So ready or not, it happens. But the flip side of the story, and I think this was the sessions here that discussed it, is that, well, it's, we're not just seeing that. We're also seeing Donald Trump. We're seeing the uh, National Front in, in, in France, we're seeing UKIP in, in, in Britain, and maybe at this stage it's pretty much a farce. We are also seeing right-wing, uh, far-right groups uh, mobilizing, beginning to mobilize in this country. So I think, ready or not, you know, <laughs> it's just kind of like the clock ticking, you know. What are we going to do to get there? And of course, then we get to the million-dollar question. I think we can agree probably won't agree on how, how, how we do it exactly, and I think there's a lot more questions asked and a lot more thinking to do, a lot more practice to do, uh, to work out the answer to the question of how we get there, but we can agree on what we want to do, what sort of movement, if you like, we want to build. And I, I think here there's a common position put by both Uncle Ken Canning and Mata Hanika. We want to build a movement for the liberation, a movement of the 99% for the liberation of the 99%. It's one big, mighty movement that we want to build. How do we get there? <laughs> Complicated process. Every country is different. All that is true. And we, had, we went through some of the stuff here. But I think, I, I, I think if there's got to be a simple rule of thumb about this, is to understand what the process is fundamentally you know, about this process, this process of building such a movement. And I think it's about uniting forces. But at the risk of using uh, an unpopular and unfashionable idea, the process of uniting those mass forces to change society involves a process of accumulating leadership. And accumulating leadership is not the self-defined leadership, as Marta pointed out today, but is actually bringing together actually existing, really proven leadership out there in the society. And I think, I, I, I think we, we have had a taste of it. Uh, in my own experience over the last couple of months, working with Uncle Ken Canning, I mean, this is a comrade who is a natural movement leader. He wasn't thrown up because he was selected by some self-appointed vanguard anywhere. Uh, he became a vanguard. He led some real movements. And now we are proud to work with him. And I think the process that we are engaged in and we need to be conscious about is to seek out the rest of the leaders in our society and bring them together in a common project to transform this society. Now we come to some of the more difficult issues, the political issues. We are confronting existing political parties. Now I think, personally, for me, I came to the conclusion that we needed to have a political break from the major parties quite a long time ago. Other people coming to this conclusion a lot sooner. And, and Rob Pine here, he only came to it pretty recently. Um, but I think there's good reason to it. Fundamentally, I think Lenin pretty much had the Labour Party figured out in the last century. Its precise relationship to the working class, it's not to say there isn't one, there's a strong historical relationship and our entire political experience in this country is shaped by that relationship, but the character of that relationship is a bit strange. According to Lenin, its primary function is to serve to mislead the working class into following behind the ruling class in this, in this country. And I think he's fundamentally right on this question. A more difficult question, I think, is the, for socialists is, and, and, uh, is, is to relate to the emergence of the Green Party in this country. For me, it's always an open question. So people have been saying, you know, should you really continue to persist to build a separate organisation or do you go into this organisation 
which in this country largely stands for a much more progressive politics than the major parties so far. I think it's an open question because and it's, it's a complicated answer. One part of it is what do we achieve that's good by organising separately to the Greens Party? And you have to make your judgement on this. Would there be a conference that you have this sort of discussion? Would there be a newspaper like Green Left Weekly? Would there be people organising consistently to build the social movements outside movements in the streets? Would there be people intervening to lead trade union struggles to try and bring together trade union militants and win them to a broader agenda, a broader agenda of revolutionary social change? Then we have questions that arise from observing what's happening in the Greens. And I think there are interesting developments that we have to reconcile with. On one hand, I think there has always been a strong pressure within the Greens, despite its origins, as a move of the party that sought to express uh, the social movements, if you like, of the last period, a strong pressure to actually put everything uh, second to winning parliamentary positions, a parliamentarism, a parliamentary outlook that is quite dominant in the Greens. And secondly, there is an ongoing struggle between left and right in the Greens, between perspectives, which perhaps is a caricature, neoliberalism on bikes is the worst, probably the, the harshest caricature, but basically people who think we can green the capitalist system and people who think that we need to change it completely. And I think uh, that's an ongoing question and therefore the question cannot be decisively ended. It depends how that struggle goes, it depends how the broader struggle in, in societies grow. So finally I want to say what the position, or what I think anyway has been the position of the Socialist Alliance in this process of recruitment of which we are part of right now. And our attitude has been, first of all, we are for the recruitment of the forces necessary to bring this, so a really big recruitment, we want to bring people together. Secondly, we do not put organisational preconceptions down on the form of organisation that will be best to take us forward. Just because we organise in the Socialist Alliance now doesn't mean that this is the form that we are attached to like some sort of fetish. We will be in a new alliance, we'll be in a new party if that takes the struggle forward. And I think that's the best, the best we can do for now. But in the meantime, we are confident that we need to preserve what the good stuff that we are able to do with the modest resources that we have today. And to that extent, I still feel it's worthwhile when I meet young new activists coming around to say it's worthwhile to join the Socialist Alliance. Not because I can tell you this is the final you know, form of the movement that's going to transform society, but because it is doing some good now and is taking us a step, steps forward in the right direction. Thank you.